But I do remind myself, you know, be kind to yourself. It's okay. It's okay to take extra time. Really give yourself time to get between one task and the next. That's a big one for me. Allowing myself the breaks between doing things to wind down and think about the next thing that I'm doing. And it takes me longer to do that than a neurotypical person, but that's okay. Thomas Edison, Richard Branson, John F. Kennedy, Mozart, Michael Jordan, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of vocations. Why is it that we rarely hear that they have or had ADHD? And you know what we hear even less about? Serena Williams, Emma Watson, Mel Robbins, Whoopi Goldberg, Agatha Christie, Aaron Brockovich, Cher. Yeah, the successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast, ADHD for Smart Ass Women. I'm your host, Tracy Atsuka. I'm a lawyer, not a doctor, a lifelong student, now a coach. I'm also the creator of Your ADHD Brain is a OK a system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD, your strengths, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest gifts. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Hello, I'm your host, Tracy Otsuka. Thank you so much for joining me here for episode number 233 of ADHD for Smartass Women. If you've been listening for a while, I bet you're starting to see your strengths and dare I say brilliance. So can you imagine what working with me would be like? Look, we love the sparkly and new, so sometimes it can feel like we're all over the place. ADHD women often tell me I am interested in so much. Which of my many interests is the one that I should actually pursue? Well, we have interest-driven brains, right? And hyperfocus. So if we can learn more about who we really are and what's truly important to us, we'll know exactly what we should be hyperfocusing on, and then the sky's the limit. That's exactly what we do in my six-week program, Your ADHD Brain is A-OK. It includes live coaching with me and a private community of women just like you. And guess what? It's open now. We have two cohorts that are still open for this year. And if you go to the website right now, you'll see the price is $11.94. But I don't want you to buy it at that price. If you're thinking about it at all, Please take advantage of the promotion and get $500 off, but don't wait because things are filling up. You can find out more at tracyoutsuka.com forward slash A-O-K. And don't forget to use the code PODCASTSASS, that's S-A-S-S, to get $500 off the program just for being a podcast listener. I would love to have you join us. So now let's get on to our regular programming. You know that my purpose is always to show you who you are and then inspire you to be it. In the thousands of ADHD women that I've had the privilege of meeting, I've never met a one that wasn't truly brilliant at something. Not one. So for this and many other reasons, I am just delighted to introduce you to Andinette Wilkinson. I know her as Andy. Andy is a creative and digital marketer with a degree in multimedia and two postgraduate degrees in education. She taught digital design and graphic design before starting her own digital agency 10 years ago. Andy sits on the board of the Manchester Digital, an independent trade body for the tech sector in the north of England. She's also a school governor, and she was one of the first admins in our now, I think it's 90,000 member Facebook group, ADHD for Smart Ass Women. Andy is happily married to a super creative, neurodiverse, fine art photographer and has four children. Two adult sons, one of whom has ADHD and one who has ASD level two, 
two daughters, one who was recently diagnosed with ADHD, and apparently she's very proud of it, which I love, and one that has similar traits but has not yet been diagnosed. Plus, there's a beagle named Luna, and according to Andy, everyone knows beagles have ADHD. In her free time, how does she have any free time? Andy likes to draw and sketch, crochet, go camping, cook, travel, especially cities, and do anything creative. Andy, welcome. Did I get all of that right? Thanks so much, Tracy. You've made me sound like the busiest person in the world. But yeah, that, that's, that is correct. You, you kind of are the busiest person in the world. I mean, four kids, you run your own business, and I honestly don't know anybody that travels as much as you do. Um, I yeah, I like to get about, and I'm look I'm lucky to have visited a lot of cities, and I love to camp. We like to go in the camper van. Um, so yeah, I think working from home, you know, you really want to get outside when you work at home. So, isn't the camper van though? Isn't that more work than just staying home? Well. It would be, except I have like a really good husband who does all the packing up and the, the unpacking and the driving and the putting the You're tent there. away. So <laughs> if you know, you like, just go you, along you, for the ride, basically all the good stuff. Yeah, Everyone knows Matthew's uh, is Mr. Outdoors. So, oh, I love it. And, and it's another testament to, I think that we do really well when we are partnered with someone who appreciates what we do well and what we really don't do well, right? And so they have those uh, complementary skills that sometimes we're lacking. I think we both have definitely have different strengths. Both Matt's dyslexic and I'm, I think, mean, his personal speak and spell, um, proofreader, and so on. And he is just great at doing all the things you know, that I, I just the basic things that I struggle with. Wonderful. So before we talk about why you're really here, can we talk about your ADHD diagnoses first? And I think there's more than an ADHD diagnosis, right? Yes. So um, going back to childhood, I was always, as many women will relate, that that child who was looking out the window or ended up sat in front of the teacher's desk because I I wasn't concentrating. I talked too much, I running in the corridor. Um through school, you know, I got by like everyone else. I was I was classed as gifted and talented. That I think that's not uncommon. Um and then I didn't seek an a uh, diagnosis. I mean I, I'm I'm 48 now. At the time I, I'm I'm going to say it wasn't really a thing that um that anybody would pick up on. But when I started to work in in teaching, especially, one of the things I really started to learn about it then, and I was struggled a lot with the most basic of things like keeping registers, submitting reports on time, all the admin type jobs um, that were in addition to just just the, the thing that I love to do, which was teach creatively. So I remember at the time asking to to do a test and they they did the test in in college but they weren't allowed for it to be any kind of official test and then you know 20 years went by <laughs> um so when so I, Andy when you said you did a test in college was that a test for ADHD yes it was through their support department and it it came out as you know 80% for because I was faculty and not a student, they couldn't do anything with that. But what they said was, we recommend you go and seek a formal diagnosis if that helps you. And, you know, of course, I never did. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> until many, many years later, when running my own business, I um, just started to think, all, I was doing a lot of juggling. I, I, I remember thinking sometimes that things were a lot harder than they needed to be. The way I reacted to things internally just didn't ever seem to match the situation. And at the time, I was really looking for answers, so I decided to go um, and see an expert about it. And as I was being, as I went through all the assessment, I was being confirmed 
and um, with that the site the psychiatrist was a really kindly man and he said to me that he went on a segue of questioning um he, he said looking at my demeanor my body language the way I described my experiences um he started a new line of questioning and then he at the end of the interview and what he put in the report was that it was ADHD and ASD and it was level one ASD which would have been called Asperger's but we don't call it that anymore but at the time that made so much sense to me but he said that the two fight each other like in t- <laughs> like um <laughs> just internal opposite personalities that are constantly fighting with each other so it explained a lot yeah So just so our audience knows, because there was a time I didn't know this. So when we use the term ASD, we're talking about autism spectrum disorder, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this diagnosis you said happened when you were 48? Um, No, I'm 48 now. So I would have been 45. Did I say 48? No, you didn't. Yeah. It's about three years ago. Who knows? Okay, three years ago. So I would love to go back in time. And if it's okay, I would love to talk about what Andy was like as a child. And Andy, if you're willing, we didn't talk about this before, but are you willing to talk about what happened in your childhood? Yeah. I'm okay. I'll talk about, yep. It's a fascinating story. And I'm sure there are people who will be able to relate to it. Yeah, for sure. So what were you like as a child? So um, looking back at my old school reports, my early childhood, I was I was happy, you know, exuberant has been used to describe me. It's very strong willed. And at school, I was known for being very creative, inquisitive. I was always the one with my hand up. I suppose like Lisa Simpson <laughs> to be a good analogy. <laughs> For me, but I always somehow ended up sat by the teacher's desk, sat at the front, so that the teacher could keep their eye on me and keep me on track, making sure that I wasn't constantly starting my work again, rubbing it out. Interestingly enough, all the things that my elder daughter is actually going through at school now as well. Ah, yeah. This is it's like the same thing over again. Yeah. But I can have so much more empathy for her. Well, I think that's probably one of the real positives, right, about having ADHD. Certainly, if you have a child with ADHD, you can really relate to what they're going through. So tell me, what was going on at home at that time? So when I was nine years old, so there has been some instances in life that caused you know, a a lot of changes. So when I was nine, my brother suddenly died. He was 19 and he, yeah, he died of uh, epilepsy. Um, And just basically one morning we woke up and he died in the night. Um, So that was just, that was just such a complete tragedy. Shortly after my father was diagnosed with cancer, and so mm. my mom, in the in the midst of having all this just profound grief, David was her, her firstborn son, her eldest. She was um, looking after a, a sick husband as well. So my dad had bowel cancer. Oh. So um, as as my dad was poorly at the end at the end stages, my mom. Um, became she was approached by the Jehovah's Witness organization they knocked on our door um offering hope of the bringing dead loved ones back to life was what they came with and interestingly enough it was an old school friend of my mum's <laughs> we always wonder <laughs> if they'd read the obituaries but with, with oh everything my was going, yeah well with everything my mum was going through at the time that the, the the trauma of losing a son and my dad um, being a terminally ill, she started to attend those meetings. And when my dad passed away, within six months, uh, my mum had remarried and 
pretty much uprooted our life. We were taken out of the school we were in. Uh, we weren't allowed to speak with our old school friends anymore. We stopped celebrating birthdays and Christmas. My mum had all, always been extremely festive and family oriented. We were cut off from all our cousins, aunties and uncles. And, you know, life just changed overnight and we we so were it was just brought into- trauma on top of trauma on top of trauma. Yeah, I mean, growing up as a child, I just think I have quite a resilient personality and it wasn't until I was well into adulthood that I looked back and thought, you know, this isn't really normal. Um, oh, this no. isn't what most people have in their lives day to day. So, yeah, um, and it was a very, very, and I, I just want to put it out there for the record that my family experience with a with a very strict stepfather was not everyone's experience and there are and you know remain to be lots of happy happy families within the organization but my upbringing was militant yeah at, from that point on basically well you um, lost and it your changed. father right who was so loving and so kind and then it was replaced by this man who was now you know, filling those shoes as far as the father figure role, but he just sounded cruel. He was emotionally abusive. You know, um, he, our lives just turned into rules, regulations, just so many petty things. If we left something lying around, it would be hidden so we couldn't find it. We'd have to spend hours looking for it. I I could talk for two hours just on this, but you know, our lives were just became it became quite fearful. You were always looking over your shoulder, and that's carried on into adulthood. That feeling of have I done something wrong? Um, I, I'm going to go get found out for something. You know, everything was banned. We couldn't have pop magazines or or pictures of our favorite pop stars on the walls. You know, everything like that was not allowed. I'd be subject to having my bag searched when I got home from school for contraband. <laughs> How many siblings were there in your family? So there were four of us. David, as I mentioned, had died. I have an older brother. And then there's myself and my sister who's five years younger than me. So did you all band together? My brother was already married at this time. And out, oh. so it was just me. It was just me and my sister. Um, we still do band together. She she left in her adulthood as well, and she actually um, has become a counselor and focuses on religious trauma. To be honest, wow. So yeah. So how did you get out of there? There is a lot of mind control. So I, I would like to compare it in a lot of ways to an abusive relationship. You are told what to wear. You were told how to think. Um, you were discouraged from having friends outside of the organization. The rule of the organization and its elders are, are absolute law. You shouldn't question them. You shouldn't read any material that isn't religious material that's not approved by them. Otherwise, you can be labeled an apostate and they practice shunning. So that is the big thing that instills fear into most of the members if you don't abide by the rules if you speak out openly against the organization you will be what's known as disfellowshipped from it and that involves actively being shunned by family and friends until Mm. you I guess repent and go back so how did I I think it took me until Sounds my, like such a loving God. Well, I'm not a religious person, and I, I oh have no, yeah, I I have no qualms with anyone who is. A lot of people that I know who have religion are do it in such a beautiful way, and yeah, that's great. But organized religion is not for me. Yeah. Um, so how I left was, I pursued an education, as you know. We've mentioned that at the start. That is actively frowned upon, I guess, because you learn to critically think. And Can I as add, time went on, yeah. Is that actively frowned on just for women or also for men? 
it's frowned on in general. Mm. Um, so, but there are there is a, a hierarchy of men and women as well. You know, women aren't allowed to speak publicly. A woman couldn't be an elder, which is the equivalent of a priest or a vicar. They're not allowed yeah. to be. Um, so many other things that women have a place within that organization. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I think it was it was my mid thirties. I was quite entrenched in it. I I was with my husband, my two not my husband, I'm married to now, um, my my two small sons, and we had moved in with my my parents. Um, I can't even remember the reasons why, but there were reasons. And it was like we were back in with my stepfather. I was with a husband I I wasn't happy with. And it just kind of occurred to me one day that I I could just like not do any of it. Um, Mm. Of course, I would have to I would have to face the shunning and leaving the organization, having to manage by myself. Um, But essentially. I just did. I quit my life. I quit my job. I uh, quit my husband. And I, I, my parents, who were disgusted with me, moved out, left me in that house. And, and wow. it was almost like I can draw a line under one life and start mm-hmm. a new line with the new one. I, I want to say just right here for the record that once my stepdad passed away, my mum just actively became my mum again she didn't shun me I think she was you know very controlled herself in a lot of ways yeah. uh, and and until she she died seven years ago you know she didn't follow the the rules that said she had to shun me she was at my wedding we went on holidays together you know she was always around for the kids was she, did she remain a Jehovah's Witness she did half of half a other family were and the grandchildren and you know if they weren't there uh, if she wasn't active in both her, her grandchildren would have been held away from her so mm-hmm. you know I, I think my mum at another generation apart her choices were a bit more limited of course of course I mean this is abuse right it is abuse yeah you are genuinely made to believe that you don't have a choice. And what really interests me now is a lot of what people are forced to do is actually contravening the human rights of religious freedom. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing is, you are just mind molded into believing that that's not the case and everything is wrong and, you know, you've got the true religion. But it never really sat with me. So it just took me a long time. So did you go away to college and then you came back and you got married? Or did the college come after you left? I was married at 19. I was a, I was a virgin bride at 19 years old, <laughs> uh, which itself is unusual these days. <laughs> and yeah. I had up to being married. I had not spent a second alone with my husband. Like we had never been alone in a room together we were always chaperoned by and oh right gosh. down to the yeah. So right so down he was to also the Jehovah's Witness, obviously. He was, and he was he was very approved because you know he he's, he's, he had a good family and he was very active in the religion. So it wasn't it was not an arranged marriage. I want to make that clear, and I don't want to minimalize that because I wasn't forced into it, but. Mm-hmm. I wasn't allowed to date who I wanted to. Um, it you, always and it sounds be. like you didn't really know him. I didn't know him. Um, he, he, like I say, we didn't have any time alone. Even my phone calls were monitored. He was allowed to phone me twice a week, and I had to sit in the same room with my parents while those phone calls took place so that they oh, could hear God. what was being said. So you you can imagine. I'm curious, when you married him, was there something inside you, that rudder, that gut, that was like, I don't think you should be doing this? I don't know, Tracy. Um, I didn't feel like 
I, I felt like that was my my option. So I had had a couple of boyfriends, you know, I had the boyfriend at 17 and the one at 18 and I'd, I'd like loved them with all my heart and I'd cried at night when it broke up for months on end uh-huh. because my parents had told me I, I weren't allowed to see them ever again. And when I was finally allowed to see someone, I kind of just went along with it all. Um, you know, it, in my own way at the time, I, I, I loved this person and he's my kid's dad. But yeah, no, it just, just being older now and having been in a happy marriage, well, we've been married for, for 11 years almost. Mm-hmm. Um, I just know the difference. But back then, I did not have anything to compare it to. I mean, you know, I, I hadn't even, yeah, I was like, I was a virgin. I had never spent time alone with with yeah. a, a man out, out so in answer to that I don't know that there, there was I, no gut to compare <laughs> yeah no, I, I was just gonna say that that you didn't even know you had a gut right or an inner rudder yeah like didn't exactly. even know those were options you know I didn't know the extent of the story Andy of course I knew a bit of it because we know each other but yes. um there was a book that came out, I don't know, maybe five or six years ago called Shunned. And okay, I interviewed the author, not on this podcast. It was when I was, you know, the precursor to this podcast, frankly, before I probably knew I had ADHD. And your stories are so similar, except your story is even more severe because there's there were also kids involved and an abusive, you know, stepfather. So I right. didn't know the story. Thank you for sharing it with us. Oh, no, uh, not at all. You can ask me what you like. I am an open book. (laughs) So (laughs) I'm thinking of like ADHD traits and perhaps ASD traits, and I want to get into that. I'm curious if these traits would come up, these symptoms would come up, and would you think, oh, this must be because of, although we knew so little about trauma back then too, but could this be because of what happened in my childhood? What happened, you know, with the Jehovah's Witness versus, oh, it's ADHD and or ASD? I think, first of all, that it, it's, it's important to say that we don't have massive biological markers for it at this, at this time, do we? we? Nobody stuck a needle in my brain and, and said, okay, you've, you've tested positive for this. <laughs> so, exactly, and and then I've I've read a few of I don't know how to say his name is it is it Gabor Mate is it uh, mm-hmm. he talks a lot about ADHD yeah. and trauma, and yeah. it may well be that it has it has exacerbated some of the um, the symptoms that I have. However, I was also diagnosed with trichotillomania around ten which is mm-hmm. hair pulling, it's compulsive, mm-hmm. compulsive hair pulling. Um, three of my children have formal um, confirmations of, of neurodiverse traits. Mm-hmm. So I would say there's a bit of both in there, um, for sure. And one thing that might be of interest is that being brought up in any any religion that is very strict, where there's a lot of adherence to rules, it can go quite unnoticed because you are in such a rigid framework yeah. that you are frightened to break out of that these don't always come to the forefront. And if they do, you know, if school expresses a concern about behavior or distractibility, you just end up getting in trouble for it. So you know, because you, you bring in shame upon your family. Um, so I'm um, sorry, I've, I think we've digressed a little bit. Um, no, did you want I think that's talk? great. Okay. Well, my question was whether it could be trauma or did you think that, oh, this must just be because of how I was raised and what I had to go through, right? So before the age of nine, when your your brother died and then your father got ill, were there symptoms and traits then 
And I will qualify that by saying this was pre-puberty as well. Yes. So there was the school reports that I mentioned. Those Some of those school mm-hmm. reports come from primary school. And yeah. there was the trichotillomania the, the, um, that was around nine or ten years old. So that, that could have that could have also been stress too, right? Again, I believe from all the reading that I've done on it, it isn't caused by stress, but it is exacerbated by it. So um, it is a compul. It's classed as an OCD. So initially, you know, I, I, like many women with ADHD or ASD, as I've been through the carousel of oh, you've got OCD, oh, you've got depression, anxiety, have this tablet. <laughs> go and see that person so but there were there were definitely you know inherent in my personality as a child before my life changed primary school I was the weird one I was the kid that Mm -hmm. people ran away from you know I just end up sitting in the library or playing Lego playing with the boys because I loved what they did much more than what the girls did you know I'd like to go into my Thank you. Well, I would have gone to my friend's house next door, but one, and we'd sit there pouring over computer magazines, typing in the programs line by line to get the computer to do things or building Lego models or Star Wars models, whatever it was at the time. I just found that so much more fun. I never had dolls or anything like that. Didn't like them. So many people aren't aware of the ways that ADHD and ASD can overlap. Would you mind explaining some of the similarities and differences that you've noticed in your own life? Okay, so I just want to say, first of all, I've forgotten what I want to say, first of all. (laughs) Oh, uh, yeah, I I just want to say that, um, nope, it's gone again. Just give me a second. (laughs) So there are a lot of similarities and sometimes they clash as well. So what I wanted to say earlier, right? Like they're fighting each other, which is such an interesting description. I'll come to that. So that's quite a fun one. But um, (laughs) yeah, firstly, we're learning more and more about the brain and neurodiversity. I don't see them as separate conditions. I, I almost see it like, there's a bunch of symptoms out there and they're, they're all like stars and we just draw our own constellation in the stars and, and whatever that constellation is and wherever it's closest to, that, that tends to be the label that we end up with. But I don't personally see them as separate things, but I believe they're all part of the same and I, I believe research will start to show that. Um, so that that's the first thing, but... The overlap, the biggest one is if you, there's slightly different lingos for the two, okay? So if if you have ADHD, it's a hyper-focus. If you have ASD, it's a special interest. I'm doing that with air quotes, by the way, special interest. Yeah, I know. Um, So those, those two are very, very close. That ability to focus for hours on end to the exclusion of all else is very much an ASD trait as well, where it's quite common with ASD. I, can, can I say to focus on nerdy things? It, it's, it's really, <laughs> no. it's really quite common. You'll meet a lot of people who are maybe just obsessed with collecting information. This was one of the things that the the psychiatrist said to me at my diagnosis. It was a really odd question, and he said, "Like, do you like to collect data and information?" And I was just gobsmacked. I'm like. Yeah, sometimes I keep spreadsheets of really weird things like who's appeared in a TV show at what time. And I was so embarrassed to say this because like, it's like a dirty secret that I do this kind of thing. But my brain just loves to collect and collate information, which is really good for, for other skills, but sometimes it just wants to do it for everything. So it, it's there's a special interest and the hyper focus is definitely a crossover i believe a lot of people with adhd have a compulsive behaviors like skin picking or hair pulling and that is also quite common with asd and 
that's where the trick, the trick diagnosis of the hair pulling fits in. Yeah. A lot of us have sensory issues and that, that spills into all areas, you know, not being able to stand noise or brightness or, or, or just every, you know, there's so much information coming mm-hmm. at you all the time. And it's just like, it's almost like, it feels like a hose pipe, like someone's got a hose pipe in your face. And that's what the information that's coming at you is like. That all these things are crossover with both. I mean, I could go on. I, I, sen- yeah. Like sensitivity, yeah. Um, anxiety. Sorry, what and was that one? And then probably the most important, right? That they, I mean, it's not even in the DSM for ADHD. I'm not sure about ASD, but emotional dysregulation, like emotional, you know, we just feel more. Yeah. This is one of the things that really made me go and seek a diagnosis once I was working for myself. And it was just this sheer extreme reaction to maybe, you know, a negative response from a client. I would let it spiral out of control in my head. And I actually remember, Tracy, listening to your podcast on RSD when I was riding my bike and I actually stopped dead in my tracks and it actually brought tears to my eyes because I'd never heard it read out before in a in a way it, it, as a list. And I was just like, oh my God, is, is this why I think nobody likes me? Is this why I react like in such a bad way internally where I'm literally mulling it over for maybe months if someone says something that I've taken personally. And so can I ask you, so Andy, that part, that RSD, is that ADHD? Is that ASD? Or is it like you say that you believe it's all kind of one big pot, which honestly, the more I read, the more I research, the more I talk to women, I sign up for that as well. So I'm curious when you're talking about them fighting, is it the same? Or is it different? I'm 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 going to go with the big pot because a lot a lot of people I know from the the community of people I know with autism struggle with with the emotional regulation as well. Uh, very sensitive, and I think when you have some difficulties reading a room or knowing if you said the right thing at the right time, and then add that to the ADHD symptoms of constantly being told that you know you're too much you're extra you're scatty all these negative messages coming to you all day then it's no wonder that regardless of which diagnoses you've ended up with that you struggle with those things as well because again not it it might be inherent to the condition but it's also made worse and amplified by the environment that we that we are in all the time so I, I, can I just give you an example? Since learning much more about it, it's a lot better because I'm able to tell myself that's not real, that's not true, that's just the way my brain wants to go right now. But this week I went out to join the Urban Sketch Group again, four years after going the previous time where I just completely bailed and didn't go again. And Wait, I what, got what to is the it? Urban Sketch? Urban Sketch is a, is a worldwide community of artists and sketchers who just like to go out in public and draw live in the environment so just sketching from life from what you see and a lot of them are are working artists it's 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 just it's a really creative movement basically they they have you can just look it up as as a thing and it has its own website but many many cities have their own little meetup communities and in manchester they meet every week in different locations and just draw and then they all throw down the art at the end of it so you know everyone can see what everyone's done and they take pictures and it always in a Facebook group it's it's very nice um so they go out together yes yeah they all meet um so Ah. uh, people people will say oh I I am an urban sketcher and they'll go out and do it alone but if there's a group nearby a lot of people like to go and meet and draw together so yeah, just I guess like a, a live art class, if if you like, in the wild, in the real, in the city. <laughs> and I I love stuff like that. I love I love you know buildings and quirky old buildings, and I like to draw things. 
But this week I went and I, I'd not been for a while. Um, it was my second time of going after a big, big break where I'd only been once. Let's just get that out there. And the, the man, one of the organizers said to me, like, you look terrified. Are you okay? He was very kind. He wasn't being, you know, wasn't being, he wasn't saying it in a bad way. He's like, don't look so terrified. And I'm like, well, I am a bit, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to draw or what, where I'm supposed to sit. You know, really just this whole awkwardness that I feel goes with me sometimes. Anyway, I went, I ended up skulking off down, down the stairs. It was the top of a viaduct. Imagine. Imagine like a tiny section of the High Line in New York. This is what they've done with this viaduct. Um, and I say a tiny section; it's, it is just a tiny section, but it's a it's it's like a high up garden from an abandoned viaduct. So, yeah, I, I kind of skulked off, ran away, met Matthew, wandered around the city for an hour, going, "I can't draw this. I don't know what to draw. I don't know where to sit." You know, and then I'm like, "I just want to go home." <laughs> and uh, he, he said, "Okay, we'll go home." And it's that kind of thing that it's just, you know, you just feel like nothing you do. It could be of any value to anyone else. So was that sensory stuff going on? Was it emotional dysregulation and RSD? You know, I'm not good enough. What am I doing here? Like, what was it? It was a mixture. There was definitely sensory stuff going on. It was very hot. Well, mm -hmm. for England. In May, <laughs> it was it was probably twenty degrees. Um, so I I felt warm. I felt flustered. I'd brought my pens with me, but one of my sketchbooks that I had with me wasn't there, and that really threw me. Like I like to have things where exactly where I know where they are in the right order. Having a, a pen missing to ruin my life. I've learned for it not to in my life, but I'm I'm just being I'm being humorous here that it's that kind of needing to have things in a specific order. Um and yeah, I just felt like I'm not as good as these artists. I don't know like I don't know what I want to draw and if I'm gonna put it down and then with every minute that ticked by, all I could think to myself was it's a minute less for my sketch. And it was it was ticking by. And then I'm like, well, I'm only going to have something really quick and rubbish and everyone else will have these beautiful detailed drawings. It's never like that. There is such a, a mix of styles and skills, but it didn't stop me thinking that way. So how does Matthew respond to this? I mean, you dragged him out there, right? <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. I did, but in my head, I thought it would be a great opportunity for him to go and like do some street photography and walk the dog. Um, but the light wasn't great for that. And he's just very fussy about the light. Um, but I, I'm just lucky that Matthew is is so easygoing and he understands my issues. He was he was very he was like, "Shall we go? Shall we sit down? Shall we have a cold drink?" Is there anything in this area that catches your eye? You know, maybe we could just stay here. And and I'm looking around. I'm like, everything's too big. It's all too big. I just need something small to look at. And the only small things are too far away. So by this time, I was so inside my own head with it all that yeah. he's like, well, we could just walk down here. And and I just I just said to him like, I just want to go home. And he just said, okay. Um, he didn't try and talk me out of it. And we just went home. That night, I picked up a, a sketch course, an urban sketch course that I just purchased online, and I, I started to do that, and I did the first drawing. So it's in my mind, my day wasn't a write-off when it came to practicing art and sketching, which I really, another different subject, but creativity and art being so good, if you are creative, it's such a good thing for your mental health. So I didn't feel like it was a washout because I came home and I drew, and that is what I'd intended to do that day. You know, I had a rethink. Yeah. yeah. That, that's great because the outcome was exactly the same. You just had to do it your own way. Exactly. Yeah. I was very particular about how, you know, what I wanted to look at, what I wanted to sketch. I don't just tend to go and go, oh, look, 
we're all just going to draw this this tree in our own way. It's got to really interest me. I love typography. I love the look of old pubs, for example, with with the yeah. the signs and and the lovely brickwork and the generally the flower displays. And I'll see buildings like that, or in the city, Manchester. Lot, we've got lots of old old buildings with some of them are colourful with tiles. And I'll look at those and go, oh, I love that. I just want to sit and draw that. Um, and I was in the wrong part of town for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you've talked about how you feel like your ADHD and your ASD are always kind of fighting. And okay. I find that so interesting because what I know of you and about you is you are one of the most organized, structured, everything in its place kind of person that I know. We know that with the ADHD brain, things need to be a certain way, you know, in order for us to feel comfortable <laughs> and to move forward. We're, we're creatures of specificity. But there's something about the structure that you're able to build. I mean, I've been in awe of you and how you do this. <laughs> and it's always sort of fought with just this whole concept I have around what it means to be ADHD in a little bit of a way I can relate to you because structure is so important to me too, because I've just found that I feel more comfortable when I have it, but it is not natural versus for you. I feel like it's actually natural. Like you've probably been that way your entire life. A am I right? Yes. I have the ADHD side of me, which is just completely spontaneous and wakes up in the morning and decides that it's going to take up a new hobby. And, you know, by the end of the day, I've purchased all the materials and the coursework and, and you know, I'm off on this new direction. But I also, as a child, I've always liked to tidy room. My sister was quite messy and I'm really good at creating mess but I can't stand mess. I have to have it tidied up. So I, I would say, my husband would probably disagree, but it's because he picks things up before I'd have, I've had a chance to. But I have to have things tidy. I have to know where everything is visually. I always have a place for everything in my mind. So if you ask me where something is, and right now we're having work done in the house, so things are not in their exact places, and that's that's a nightmare for me. But I, I could always tell you where anything is because everything has a place. Digitally, I'm exactly the same. Um, so when I was younger, I used to, we spoke about information before. So, you know, I would make notes on things and file them and keep keep little files of things. I used to love those index cards. <laughs> that Me was, too. Yeah, stationery and index cards were just were just like my Barbie dolls, I think. So that's always stayed with me that that level of you know having a having to have things in alphabetical order color color order whichever order suits the situation and you know I am a massive I declutter all the time I listen to podcasts and conferences on decluttering I, I join this decluttering summit once a year and listen to all the talks everything goes in my calendar um I use something called Reclaim at the minute, which is kind of a game changer. We use Asana for business as a, as a to-do app and it just connects to my calendar. And every time I have a task, I just press this button and it puts it in my calendar around frameworks that I've put in place, obviously. So yeah, it, it, it's basically if then something crops up and I can't do that, it automatically reschedules it for me. Or if I put a meeting in or yeah, it's it's absolutely great. Everything's always on your radar. And it's called Reclaim, but it, it works mainly with something like Asana or it works with Google Calendar or my no Google Calendar it works with. It's it's a task scheduler and it's an intelligent task scheduler. So it it just works all around how important your priorities are and, and what you know, whether you want to do something in personal time or solo time. It, it's still newer in its development. There's a similar one out there called Motion, which I tried for a while, but it was very it was very slow and buggy. This one is much better. And I'm just really, 
I think things like this are absolutely brilliant for anyone I'm going to say anyone with ADHD who is tech minded, who has tech patience, because I know not everybody does. They they just, even the act of setting it up would be really stressful. But I think if that kind of thing works for you, it's, it's, they can be life changing. So I love, I love routines, boxes, everything having its own box, everything having its own place. Uh, I really utilize the iPhone focus modes um with the apple watch so in the more i have different modes for different times of the day so when i wake up my phone only shows me the apps that i used between waking up and starting work once i start work it only shows me the apps that are pertinent to work and so on i have an evening one and then i have a bedtime one and then i have the do not disturb and they took time to set up but I love, I absolutely love doing stuff like that. I, I could make a career of it, to be honest. Um, I, I was actually just thinking of that. <laughs> I, I on, honestly do really excel at digital organization. I am like the queen of it. So, yeah, I know all the things, how they work, how to set them up. And if you have the time and patience to do that with your phone, it's magic. You know, if I look at my phone now, it's only got things on it in front of me that might be of interest to me at this particular time of day. Huh. You know, what I've noticed when there is, and I hate using the term comorbidity, it just sounds so like, well, yeah. pathologized. But when you yes. look at ADHD and autism, and I think of the people that I know, and the people that I've also, you know, read about, there are so many women with that combination that are so successful because they have the creativity but their executive functions like, you know, the planning and the, you know, time management and all of that, those executive functions tend to be so strong. So I am curious about particular strengths or abilities that you believe stem from the overlap of ADHD and ACD. I mean, ASD, not ACD. ACDC. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I think I'm fortunate in that organizing as especially digital and working with computers has always been one of my special interests. So I, you know, I can spend hours getting sucked into tasks that many people find really, really difficult and hate, like organizing my files, organizing my pictures. I'm an inbox zero person. Um, you know, well, you're all going to hate me for that, but I, yeah, I just, I um, I hate you, Andy. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I, Every, every day I, I zero out my inbox, I forward anything that's a task to Asana, then I press a button and it goes into my calendar, then I know it's going to get done. Only because I spend time every day consistently doing these things and I have also accepted that as a person with ADHD, I probably am going to spend a bit longer organizing my life than other people and I I. I I think possibly because of not not having it confirmed until my mid forties, I I just learned to cobble this skill set together to have to get by in a world where you know I'm I'm a mother and I'm working because I have this I one of my big traits and I think you know this I have to be learning all the time I'm always learning something so. If you're if you're that way inclined and you're always trying to learn new skills, I don't like to just say slump at the end of the day and you know I I can be tired like lots of us with ADHD, but I will I always need to be doing something sketching, crochet, learning to code, just anything to keep my brain busy. So yeah. reading a book, you know. Well, and when we don't, right, we get kind of depressed. Very much so. Um, I, I feel... We're in that mode network. Yeah, I, th I think being creative, especially if that's a core thing of, of your person, you need to be creative. Otherwise, you're gonna, you are going to get depressed. It's, it, we thrive off it. I think we mentioned the a ASD and ADHD clash earlier, and I just I think of 
how I mentioned travel and and cities and it's all that color and and everything that is visual to the eyes that's really exciting to me and I love that it's also exhausting at the same time but it's very like creatively inspiring when I go out and I'm I'm seeing all this around me it's like I always find I get ideas I I I get ideas for my business for you know stuff I want to do for hobbies and 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 things like that so yeah they they are constantly fighting I I think when you've lived with it your whole life you don't it's just part of who you are you know I love to travel but I get so anxious before I travel like I just you know I melt down I can't function you just need to get there and then once you get there I, you know, and that's so interesting because, again, executive function. So whereas you're very good at the planning and scheduling, then actually doing the work that you've already put, a, you know, like you've already created the structure, that can be difficult for you. Yeah. So I, I like to say I'm the fun coordinator of the family. I will. I have a Trello board for the whole year. <laughs> it's got all oh the weekends gosh. on it. Yeah. And she also, does. we don't do things that... Every- I do. I really do. And, and that's another I'm, another thing I'm embarrassed about. It's like the the information secrets. Um, but I like to, if we've got anything like events that I'm interested in, I'll put them on there in the ideas column, any restaurants I want to visit. If I do decide to do something and get tickets for it, they'll go in the board. And when I have holidays, that all goes into a board. So all that I'm great with because I love doing it. But then if you ask me to pack a suitcase, can I do that? No, I cannot. Um, Can you unpack it? Pa- I'm, I'm actually better at unpacking than packing, but it might take me three weeks. Three weeks to do. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Packing cubes uh, change change the world. By the way, that that's like I discovered those recently, and that does make a lot of difference. It's like, oh, we can put T-shirts. Yeah, because you can actually just go, well, I can put some, you know, underwear in here. I can put tops in there. I can put bottoms in there. I can put cosmetics in there. And then I can, you know, so it's instead of it being a big jumble, there's there's a structure to it. Again, I don't know if that's like more, if I'm talking to people here with ASD and they're going, yeah, or people with ADHD are saying packing cubes. What, what no. else are you trying to make me do? <laughs> but for but me, we want, we want to be more organized. We want the structure. In fact, I just bought a brand new suitcase. I think it's going to come today or tomorrow by Soul Guard. Have you seen okay. it where it's literally, there's like a, oh, how do I say it? There's a section inside the suitcase that just pulls up and you organize it almost like, um, in your closet, you'd have like a cupboard where you put the t-shirts on the top, you know, you put the pants oh, next, no. you put the, and then you literally just pull it out of the suitcase and hang it in the closet when you get to your destination. And that's how you live. So it stays organized. You know I'm going to own one. You know I'm going to own one by the end of the week. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait till I get mine and then I'll tell you if it's really as good as um, it appears to be. Okay. Okay. That sounds, that sounds good. So. Andy, we are running so late, but I've got to ask okay. you one one more of the you know general questions, which is all about ADHD, ASD, and tech, and then being a woman on top of all of that. So the intersection of all of that. So, yeah, I I think the biggest thing for me, and it's something I'm really working on now, has is struggling with confidence. I am. I'm currently doing a program called the Confidence Collective in my local area for women who struggle this way, not particularly neurodiverse, but women in tech. And it's been quite empowering to meet a whole bunch of other women who struggle in similar ways. But imagine, you know, you are you already feel awkward in a room and then you're in a space where it's very, very male dominated for one. And, you know, we're still in that world, even though it's changing, that men know more about this thing than you do. And women, women don't code as well. And I've heard all this, you know, directly from people. So in a lot of ways, I would say the 
the traits I have are very helpful to the work I do, which is a lot of analyzing data, SEO, getting to grips with different software. Um, I'm always at a computer. I'm always having to learn. But the side of me that is is an introvert really, really struggles. I can be a quiet little mouse in the corner. And internally, I have so much to say, but I'm always just afraid to to say it. Um, and even on paper, I'm very good at it because this is why I am things like a governor and on the board of a trade body. But I even struggle in the, in those rooms to to assert myself or even feel that I've got anything worth asserting, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Intelligently, I know I do. But in reality, it, it that is something I just massively struggle with. And I'm really trying to work on you know, being just more myself, like posting, trying to post more on LinkedIn for business purposes, but but coming across as authentic, which is it's a really strange space to do that in because there's so much I, how do I say this? Having um ASD as well, a lot of us tend to mask and mimic because there are social things that are slightly off there. And it's like, well, okay. This this is person A. They're successful at that. They behave like this. Therefore, I have to do the same. And then mm-hmm. you try and do that, and it's not you. And it can be a little bit, it can be disastrous, or it can just feel completely wrong because you're not being authentic. So uh, those are a lot of the things I struggle with in that space. Being a business owner, uh, being a company director, having staff to manage, trying to grow a business, um, knowing that I. I know a lot about the subject matter, but don't really feel confident or inspirational as a leader. You know, it's so interesting because what I know about you, you are nothing if not authentic. So the fact that that is a concern, I'm like, what? Andy? Yeah, and I I think it's not that I don't, when when I think about posting on LinkedIn, I always think, oh, it's cringy. Everyone's going to be like, you know, I don't really care that you have, have done this or that new job. So what I've decided to do recently is just be me. Just So some of my latest posts are about the fact that I've been out sketching and this is what I do to keep my mind, you know, from just being stuck behind a screen all day and how that's helpful. So trying to put a business angle on it. But also, I want to talk more about um, inclusion and diversity in the workplace. And I think there's so many people in the tech space, like so many, that are neurodiverse. Because I'll tell you one thing, this skill set, especially on the ASD side, tends to go hand in hand massively with things like analysts, computer programmers, people in science fields. And... For some, it's like a badge, but a lot of women are very scared that if they come out there and just say it, that they're going to get discriminated against because it's like, well, okay, you, you know, you're not really going to fit in. Um, so I'd like, I'd like to see a lot more change around that personally because so many people who have that ability to focus and really think outside of the box and just learn and learn and learn until they get it right you know, they end up being really good people in the tech space. I mean, well, doesn't, Elon you, Musk, doesn't Elon Musk, doesn't Elon Musk have a ASD? He does. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and, I think and, any of the time. A little bit of ADHD, right? Yeah. <laughs> a little ADHD empathy. Must, must start Although, with wait, all let me back up. Yeah. That is not true because people uh, with ASD have as much empathy as anybody else. Correct? I would say we are... And I, you've met one person with ASD. You've met one person, but many people exactly. I know we are overfeeling. Yes, it, it's just, it's just for me. If I can't relate to it in any way, that's when I struggle with with. But I think that's all of us with empathy, right? Because empathy is that ability to see yourself in other people's shoes. But I, you know, I have tons of empathy, and even beyond you know, that, will, that we can. It's not to me just being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes, I think it's also being able to put yourself there. And if you have a different response, 
being able to say, okay, that wasn't my response, but that's their response and believe it. Yeah, exactly. Um, I do, honestly. It's one of the things that does actually really get to me when people say autistic people have no empathy because Mm -hmm. I generally find they have a ton of empathy. What they do have is analytical uh, brains and they are generally much more direct with communication. So sometimes that can come across as a lack of empathy. So Mm. I have a habit of, I have a habit of responding to emails very quickly with the answer that someone's asked me a question to and forgetting to say, someone's asking me how I am, how my weekend was. Then they asked me a question. I just answered the question. And then, you know, then I think, oh gosh, I, I, (laughs) I just didn't ask how they were, but that doesn't mean I don't care how they are or, you know, I don't, I don't genuinely. Yeah. And I, I love like seeing people's travel pictures and what they're eating and I, I'm interested in people and I have plenty of empathy, but I am, well, our rapid brain means that sometimes I'm just really direct and I don't always think of social niceties. And I think that's where that myth comes from, really. Yeah. I'm just like you, Andy. I literally have to stop yeah. and say, how are you? You know, are at it, yeah. right? Because you've, <laughs> you, you'll pull the email back because, oh my gosh, I didn't. And sometimes I just don't because, you know, they asked a question, I respond. And I, I guess it depends on who it is. And if your brain is 12 steps ahead, you're already thinking like, well, this person already knows I like them and that, you know, I, right. I think highly of them. So I'm just going to get to the point. <laughs> so I completely agree. I completely agree. So what do you think the key to living successfully with ADHD and ASD is? I think the biggest thing that I've, I've learned is to give myself grace and just accept that it's okay. You know, any of the things I struggle with, it's okay. It's not a competition. One of the things that my psychiatrist said to me at the time, which was one of the nicest things I'd actually ever heard, was that here you are, you've gone through life, you are, you've climbed Mount Everest without a Sherpa when everyone else mm-hmm. around you is climbing up as well, but they've got their own team. And that yeah. was that really resonated with me. I think you have to stop being so hard on yourself. Yeah, it might be harder for us to get there and do things but we should be equally be proud when we've done it that we did it without the Sherpa um you know so doesn't that make it even more of an achievement yeah and then we should go find the Sherpas right we should get as much as we we possibly can yeah I'm I'm all I'm all for the Sherpas don't get me wrong I wouldn't climb Everest without one but um I I think it was a good analogy and I, I think I've really learned to to be kinder to myself. And I think that's really important. We're very harsh critics and I still am, but I do remind myself, you know, hang on, be kind to yourself. It's okay. It's okay to take extra time. Give yourself time, really give yourself time to get between one task and the next. That's a big one for me. Allowing myself the breaks between doing things to wind down and think about the next thing that I'm doing. And it takes me longer to do that than a neurotypical person, but that's okay. Yeah, but then once you lock in, you lock in a lot faster and a lot longer, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I I would say that I could probably do in two days what some people do in a week. And I don't mean Mm -hmm. that in a, 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 a boasting way. It's just that once you do get tuned in, you can get so much done. Well. I mean it in a boasting way. (laughs) (laughs) Andy, where can people find you if they want to know more about you and what you do? So um, you can find me on Instagram, just as Andanette. That's just me personally. My business is uh, made by factory. If you wanted to take a look at what I do there, uh, it's, it's web, it's SEO. Uh, made by factory.com. I have an unusual name, so you pretty much can find me anywhere by just looking for my name. So literally on Instagram, you're just Andwinette, Andanette? Just just Andanette. But I do I've 
I've also started sketching and I've just made an Instagram for that, which is and Annette Wilkinson. So actually, if anyone wants to follow me anywhere with my five sketches, this is going to be a journey. <laughs> I'd love to get a follow there. <laughs> okay. And I just want to say that you're wonderful at what you do. So thank you. I have personal experience. So thank you that for that. That is true. Yes. <laughs> yeah. She did my website. So anyway, Andy, thank you so much for spending time with us here today. I really appreciate this conversation. Thanks for having me. You know that I've wanted to come on for ages, so I really appreciate it. No, I I appreciate it more. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So that's what I have for you for this week. If you like this episode with Andy, please let us know by leaving a review. Our goal is to change the conversation around ADHD, helping as many women as we possibly can learn how their ADHD brains work so that they too may discover their amazing strengths. Before I go, don't forget to check out my live coaching program, Your ADHD Brain is A-OK. There is also a private community with women just like you. And you can find out more information at tracyoutsuka.com forward slash A-OK. If you sign up now with the code podcast SASS, S-A-S-S, you'll get $500 off just for being a podcast listener. As always, you're listening to ADHD for Smart Ass Women. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you here next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smart Ass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Outsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Not coincidentally, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, it's also the name of our free Facebook group. We're a totally smart-ass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. Join us at tracyoutsuka.com, where you can also find more information on our Your ADHD Brain is A-OK system. I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week.